Okay, so, um, all right, so then to, to wrap up the Endangered Species Act part of this, uh, we talked about this as a conservation tool. We mentioned that, um, right, uh, the numbers are only growing overall planet-wide. More and more organisms are um, showing up as being uh, threatened or endangered. Um, and uh, and uh, it's just, it's just it's always seems to be happening. Different groups are, are disproportionately at risk of, of going extinct relative to others because of their, where they live or their particular um, natural history attributes. Some general criticisms of the ESA from a conservation perspective is that originally it didn't define what a species was in a legal sense. Um, another key broad critique of the Endangered Species Act is it's very much emergency room conservation biology, right? It's triage is management. It's waiting till the accident comes into the hospital and then treating the, the wound or the injury, right? As opposed to, uh, you know, losing weight and exercising and doing all that stuff and getting your vaccinations and stuff ahead of time. Um, another really, really key realization that's become very obvious over the last couple decades is that is the importance of preserving the organism's habitat. Once we lose the habitat, it's exponentially harder to recover the organism. Um, and so it, it's just is so much cheaper, efficient, effective, better, everything if we can do this process sooner rather than later. Okay, here is some recent data. This is from this morning from the feds. And these are number of species uh, listings. Okay, so this could be either like a candidate for listing. This could be something that's classified as a threatened or endangered or whatever. And this is the number per year. So have a look at that. And so this ranges from uh, 19, so the, the 60s, so this goes from the, the predecessor of the Endangered Species Act to, uh, to, to last year. So do you see any rhyme or reason to this? Brian says no. Okay, so, so Max is saying it seems like from like 1971 or so, it kind of is like on a, a sort of bit of an uphill spike until the about mid 90s, and then it seems to be on a precipitous downward spike. It kind of looks like a histogram, that trend. Kind of like uh huh. This is the number that's being added every year or currently on that list? This is the number being added. Uh, well, I mean, they're not necessarily added list, but the, but the different categories. They might be threatened and then they move to endangered or they move, they move categories. So this is, this is, this is a, a, a changed category uh, on the list. I mean, it definitely died out 2020. Why? Uh, politics. Politics. Dead. Politics. Okay, so here's a, a recent paper um, to look at that. And so let's have a look at this figure right here. So here we go. Again, time, not quite as old as, as the graph I made, but that's okay. So mid-80s to 2020, okay? This is the cumulative number of listings. This is the funding per species. And this is how, how, and this is how much money we get uh, in appropriations. So here we go. So let's have a look at this. So, right, so, and this is going, this is percent, this is all relative to 1985. So this is, this is on 1985 efforts or dollars or whatever. Okay, so here we go. So uh, the listing things are kind of going up, 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 and they kind of flatten, right? And we have this flattened period. And they kind of go up, up, up again, and then like 2016, they flatten. Um, and so if we look at who is in control, you find uh, different administrations seem to be uh, more predisposed to let stuff happen. Uh, and, and this is not, a, I'm not trying to make a political argument here, I'm just making a reality argument. This is what's been going on. This is the data speak for themselves. Um, the approach, because the Endangered Species Act was written so well and has stood up to all these legal challenges, the approach, as with our other conservation biology tools that are really effective and useful, what you find is opponents of conservation, 
do not attack the, the bill, the, the policy, the main thing itself. They do death by a thousand cuts. They also do death by no funding. So there's a very, very clear policy approach. Folks know they can't say, hey, let's go kill the last bald eagle, right? They know, people, they know the general public is like, nah, I don't like that. So what they do is they defund the agency. So instead of getting whatever you need, $100 million to do all your stuff, you get $10 million. And because the people that work there are like you and I, and, I, and th I've seen this over and over again. So people say, they say, hey, you guys, what do you need? And you go, we need $10 million in 10 years to do this. And they go, nope, here's $2 million, you have a year and a half. Almost always what happens, people go, okay, fine, right? You can't do a robust job. You can't do a kick butt job. And so what ends up happening is these agencies become massively overworked, massively overburdened, and instead of taking a year or two or three to generate a habitat conservation plan or whatever it is, a species recovery plan, it takes 10, 15 years. And then everybody gets ticked off. The landowner who's a, who's a good guy or the rancher or whoever is a good person, and they're like, hey man, I wanna go forward with this activity. And the agency is saying, wait, we gotta do this study first. And it takes a year, two, three, five, 10 years. And then that person starts saying, government sucks. Government doesn't work. These folks, these, these scientists are inept. These scientists don't understand, right? And it, and it breeds this hate and this discontent for the process itself. And that's what's going on here. That's why this stuff flattens out during these different administrations, because they defund it or they put people into the office that are not scientists. People that, are, that don't have any business doing this stuff and are just sitting there to slow everything down. And their whole deal is to gum up the works, gum up the works, gum up the works, gum up the works, gum up the works. Hoping for the day when everybody gets so fed up, they go throw the baby out with the bathwater. Get rid of this thing, right? It's a very deliberate, very distinct tactic. Um, and let's look at, so when critters come off the list, well, I, I have another slide on this. Okay, so, so um, we've been using species recovery plans since 1978. Um, most of the goals, as we've seen with some of the examples we've talked about so far, is to have at least one viable population, and depending on the, the plan, they might have multiple required, and usually it's a self-sustaining population, one that doesn't need people intervening. Uh, the continued degradation of the biosphere is making that a challenge. There's some species, like salmon, that we might always have to help, that they might never, in, the, in our modern world, might never be um, self-sustaining, possibly. And then just, I'll, I'm going to jump to this quick and we'll wrap up in a second here, but just, I'll just say that different studies have been done over the years and um, some of the pr problems we discovered in the 90s and early 2000s were, for example, some of the species recovery plans had a recovered population, uh, about, about a third of the plans looked at in this particular study would, are a smaller population size than we have right now, right? That's kind of weird. That seems a little strange. Um, uh, yeah. And so people have, have described this as managing the extinction, not managing recovery of the species. And we kind of got sucked into this foolish um, uh, catch-22 thing because of all these budget cuts and things. Um, OK, as of today, 104 species Federal, um, Federal Native species, species Act, 104 species have been delisted. 71 or 68% of these because they were recovered. So the majority of them because they went the direction we wanted to. And then this isn't all 70, 71, I didn't have time. I just, this is a, an old list of 22, a previous list of 22 that I ran through. But basically suffice it to say, what were the drivers what were the drivers of the endangerment? Well, how do we get there? Invasives in some cases, DDT specifically for a lot of our birds, World War II for some species that just blew the heck out of these rare islands or atolls or whatever, habitat loss, 
over harvesting a large number of these 22, of these ones it recovered, right? So that tells us that, that over harvesting is one of the easier things to reverse, right? It's just like, don't stop, right? Whereas it's a little bit harder to, it's obviously harder to deal with invasives. Or if an invasive is a threat, it's, it's a lot harder to get those guys to be recovered. Um, and some of these legacy pollutants and blowing up the reef, you know, physically destroying the architecture is, is a hard one. Eight or, and this, this is rounded numbers now, eight or 8% 8 rounded um, uh, were delisted because we got better population data. Um, uh, uh, 13% were delisted because we changed the taxonomy. We now decided it was actually part of the same species. We thought there were two or something of that nature. And then 11% we just lost and they went extinct and we were not able to save them in time. Uh, and this is what you guys said from your, from this semester, from you, from your posters this semester, when you guys looked at what were, what was driving the, you know, the big conservation challenges, the, you know, habitat loss, habitat fragmentation was the biggest uh, uh, source you thought for the species that we looked at this semester. Uh, followed by pretty closely um, uh, introduced species and over harvesting is that one you can't see and then uh, and then pollution and climate change are the 16 and the 35 percent. Um, yeah. Um, how could we strengthen the ESA? Um, uh, in general, grounding it more in conservation science will probably generally produce better outcomes. In particular, though, reducing the time it takes to list these critters. So when we decide they're in, find they're in a problem, let's react and help them quickly. Um, as I mentioned before, extending things to, to the non-traditional vertebrates. You know, everyone wants to save the birds, everyone wants to save the whales, everyone wants to save the tigers, but, but including more organisms would be good. Potentially protecting hybrids. That isn't something we normally hear about. Seth, when we visited the wildlife corridor, you know, they're like, we gotta watch out for hybrids. Um, and, and we're worried about hybrids with our endangered plant work here on campus. But in some cases, we might wanna save the hybrids because at least maybe we have some of those genes protected in particularly rare species. You have to do it in a careful way, but that might be useful. Um, potentially the idea of extending this evolutionarily significant unit to how we define species for a, in a legal context might be useful. Um, and, and just in general, casting a wider net um, might be more useful rather than waiting for one specific species, et cetera. Habit, um, uh, another uh, natural area conservation plans and these other uh, habitat conservation plans are, are essentially a response to this issue and are a, a new tool that's evolved over the last couple years or sometimes called multi-species recovery plans. Where we do multiple species at once. We do a system at once. Um, uh, yeah, more population viability assessments. We didn't do any of those this semester, but you've read a little bit about them. Um, source sink models, that kind of stuff would really help. Again, as I mentioned before, the multi-species approach is really likely to be much more helpful. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, in general, our goal should be to establish multiple populations, not just one or more, but actually um, rigorously separated uh, populations would generally be helpful. Avoid a catastrophic disease out outbreak or natural disaster that we're having more frequently. Um, move more aggressively to stop known threats, easier said than done. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and plan to have annual growth rates, not just long-term gro growth rates, but annual uh, growth rates of, that are positive. Um, I think I'll sk skip that stuff. And I'll just say, um, yeah, 